This is Bandit Top Atari 8-Bit Podcast. There was no way that this machine would be accepted by a touch typist if you had to shift to get lower case. I met Steve Wozniak, and I was the first person that he had ever met who was taking computers into school, so he gave me the first Apple. So we have Apple 1, number 1, and Apple 2, number 10. One of the things very few people know about Jay is that he was interested in nudism, and the local uh, nudist group used to have their parties at his house. So I would have to go and stand in the administration payroll, the, the accounting office, and say, it's a week after my payday, and I have not received my check. Write me a hand check and put it in the system later. And I'm going to stand here until you do <laughs> The guys who started Activision were at Atari. Somebody asked me how much I was being paid, and I told them. And they said, $40 an hour? We're in the wrong business. And they all quit and said, <laughs> if you want us to work for you, hire us back as consultants for $40 an hour. I'm Kevin Savitz, and this is an interview episode of Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. Liza Loop wrote the first user's manuals for the Atari 400 and 800 computers, she was a consultant technical writer for Atari from June 1979 through April 1980, sometimes writing documentation for interfaces that had not been designed yet, so her description became the de facto interface specification. Liza also worked for Personal Software, where she wrote the reference manual for the original VisiCalc program, and in an interesting Atari-related note, she and her husband, Steve Smith, were married by Atari 400-800 designer Jay Miner. She talks about that in the interview, too. This interview was conducted January 28, 2015. As of the day I'm recording this in April 2015, Liza hasn't been able to find the manuals and newsletters that we discussed to scan them, but she says she's still on the lookout. When she finds them and we get them scanned, they'll be added to the show notes at ataripodcast.com. I understand that you wrote the the original first user manuals for the Atari 400 and 800. Is that right? That is correct. So, all right. How did you get that gig? <laughs> well, a friend of mine uh, named David Yardrum um, got a gig at Atari um, making the, porting the uh, Microsoft to the Atari. Um, and he was, uh, one of the founding members of the Sonoma County Computer Club. This was 19... Well, we started in 76. This was 78. Uh, we started the, the Computer Club in 76. This was... Um, yeah, this was this was 1978 when they were first developing the Atari computers, and it was not even called a 400 and 800 yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, so David um, moved down to the peninsula from to Menlo Park from um, Santa Rosa, California, or Katati, and called me up very excited one day saying, Liza, there's nobody here who knows anything about users, and they need somebody to write the manuals. Why don't you come down and interview? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I did. Interviewed with Wade Tuma and um, got the gig. And why did you know about users? Why did I know about users? Well, because, let's see, in 1972, I took a course mm-hmm. in Montessori education at Sonoma State. Okay. And uh, the co-instructor uh, of that course was a man named Dean Brown, who was then at SRI, um, and happened to be working with the head of a Montessori school, using um, the pilot language on teletypes um, to teach five, six, and seven-year-olds how to program their Montessori lessons into um, into pilot and uh, mm-hmm. let other kids play their, quote, games, which were mm-hmm. learning games. And I spent five minutes in the room with Dean and said, that's my career, that's where I'm going. I was 72, Um, and so I thought about it for a couple of years, had another child and, uh, decided to open a public access computer center, which is called learning options, open portal. 
or loop, mm-hmm. which is a pun on my last name. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, and um, opened the doors in Katati, California, in a second floor office with a teletype to call computer. Um, and I think that was the first thing we had. Anyway, um, I didn't so, know anything so it's, about... It's like 1975 or something, and you've got a... 1975. It's got a le- you've got a learning center for kids using computers? Yeah. Wow. So that's cutting uh, edge. I mean... Yeah, it was cutting edge. I mean, but that's not unusual. I grew up in a family that was always cutting edge. And I was that was what I was expected to do. So I did it. <laughs> um, and uh yeah, we had we had a teletype, we had um I bought a deck PDP eight. So we had that. Um so anyway, uh, because I didn't know anything about computers, I had to find a way to learn about computers. So I started the Sonoma County Computer Club, and that way all the local computer hackers um, started meeting at Loop Center. Uh, and they taught me. Um, so by 78, I'd been doing this for three years. Um, we moved Loop Center from our upstairs business office to a storefront. And from one storefront to another storefront, um, we had, I was taking, um, loading my teletype and my desktop, my my desk computer, my PDP-8, and a couple of others into uh, the back of a pickup truck and taking them to schools. Uh, And let's see, in seven, actually in 76, um, another thing that my computer club members got me to do was to go to Homebrew Computer Club and I met Steve Wozniak and I was the first person that he had ever met who was taking computers into school so he gave me the first Apple which wow. we have so we have Apple Apple 1 number 1 and Apple 2 number 10 um, wow and I've taught with those so they're just like so anyway, in closet somewhere they're, they're <laughs> yeah they're um they're stored at the moment. Um, cool. But um, so so I was just taking computers around to uh, introduce people to computing, um, which at that time included having to learn how to um, dial up um, through Telnet to some other computer or um, flip the switches, run switches on a uh, an Altair or um, <laughs> on a PDP-8, um, flip the bin, bin loader in, and then you could load basic from paper tape uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> through a teletype. Um, so you had to learn a lot about computing at that time, uh, as well as uh, I was teaching basic. Um, and we had the first little standalone computers um, as well as um, as um, timeshare uh, accounts at various different places. We had an account with Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley, for example, which had lots of games and educational software. And we, we were not only for kids. We were kids and adults because everybody was a beginner. Right. So sure. th- three years of doing that, and I knew about users. Okay. That's, it. That's a great answer to my question. All right. So you know about users. You went in, you were hired as a technical consultant. writer, at a technical consultant, editor. So you're not an employee? That's right. Or were you? I'm sorry? And I was, I was only there for um, nine or ten months. I wasn't okay. there a long time. But when I, after I left, um, I ran the Atari users group for a while. Okay. All right. So they, they basically plunked you down and said, please write manuals? Well... It's something like that. They, what they did is basically said, um, we need a user's manual. Mm-hmm. And I said, fine. Um, what are the specs for the machine? And they said, specs for the machine? I said, yeah, you know, what, what, am, I, what am I documenting? Mm-hmm. And they said, well, we don't know. It's not built yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they said, you write the manual and we'll make it work that way. 
<laughs> wow. Um, and it, it, it turned out they really did know a lot about how it was going to work. Mm-hmm. But, um, but they hadn't finished the user interface. So they were all excited about the plastic and mm-hmm. um, the, the look and feel of the machine rather than, um, well, there were, there were no, <clears throat> as we referred to them, complete idiot users in the building. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were two technical females. The other one ran the, the Calma machine. Uh, <laughs> I did, the other uh, ran the what machine? The Calma machine. It was a um, logic um, layout machine for okay. laying out circuit boards. Um, but she didn't. She just knew how to operate it. She didn't know anything about computing or teaching other people to use computers. It, basically, um, I imagined what I thought it should be like, and um, wrote the manual. And, and as the as they developed the user interface, I corrected the manual to match the user interface. Can you give a specific example of something that you wrote, and then and then it came to pass because? You had well, the, written it. The best one is um, they decided that uh, it should have a, uh, a word processor, and of course it's a cartridge machine, and those cartridges are small. So putting a word processor into one of those cartridges was a challenge. And after they had, and I've forgotten who was working on the on the word processor, but but when they when they presented me with this piece of software. Um, they were one, I don't know whether it was a bit or a byte, over the cartridge limit. Mm-hmm. And the the Atari keyboard, the native keyboard was uppercase. And um, some of the implementations, if you wanted to get lowercase, you had to use the shift key. Mm-hmm. So they said, oh, well, we'll just do that for the word processor and have it, when you type, you type in uppercase. And if you want to get lowercase, you, sh- you shift. Mm-hmm. And that saved them the one byte. And I had a fit. Uh, I was also working with, with a guy named Greg Yob, who's the person that wrote the game Hunt the Wumpus. Um, and so Greg and I were talking about this, and, and we both agreed that there was no way that this machine would be accepted by a touch typist if you had to shift to get lower case because that's not mm-hmm. the way a typewriter works. And right. anybody who's a prof- professional typist has that process automated and to have to change it um, would destroy their, their speed typing. But all of the engineers at Atari were touch, you know, were hunt and peck typists. So they didn't care. Right. Right. <laughs> so I said, absolutely not. We can't do it that way. It has, if you, if you really want to sell this machine and there's a tremendous market, for this, it's the, it'll be the best word processor available. And we didn't have a word processor at Atari. I wrote those manuals using Tico, which is um, Dex Te- uh, Digital Equipment Corporation text editor. <laughs> Eventually, they, they found a way to fit it in, and the word processor came out um, with a shift properly, properly implemented. Huh. Wow. That's a great um, example. But, yeah, and that's that's the best example. The uh, the others, um, I, I don't think I had all that much influence. Um, it's just that it, it wasn't. Uh, well, here are the technical specs, and and here's here's how we know it's going to work. Um, so, document it this way. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's we're still inventing, and we'll let you know when um, when it's. Well, we've got something, and then we talked about it. Um, but this, this, these manuals were not technical manuals. They were starting with how do you open the box. Um, and what I did was um, I envisioned um, who the various users might be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, there were computer hobbyists who are notorious for not reading manuals. So I wasn't worried about <laughs> writing the manual for them. Right. So my, my, my sort of videotape in my head was um, a family and the parents had bought their son 
the Atari at, and, and they were marketing it at Sears through the sporting goods department. Uh, so they bought the Atari computer um, from Sears mm-hmm. and for, as a graduation present, high school graduation present for their son. And the son and the father had didn't have any trouble opening the box, looked at the hardware, and there was only one way to put it together. They put it together, and they were playing games the evening of the guy's graduation. And mm-hmm. so the next day, the father and the, and the son have left the house. And the mother, who's a housewife, um, has finished making the beds and cleaning up the breakfast dishes and decides to take a coffee break, and she thinks, maybe I'd like to see, see, play with this computer. Mm-hmm. She's she's the person I wrote the manual for, okay. um, because the others wouldn't use it. Um, right. So although there were pictures to demonstrate how to get it out of the box and unpack it in the beginning of the manual, um, there were also um, instructions as to how to put the cartridge in, how to turn it on, how to change games, and um, then there was a. a tutorial on basic language. So how to program at the back of it. And that's all we had. It was a it's small twenty page pamphlet, heavily illustrated. And my philosophy is that um people have different learning modalities. Which means some people learn best through pictures, some people learn best through charts and tabular information, and some people learn best through narrative. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that manual, all of the messages are encoded in all three ways. Everything you need to know, you can get from the pictures, you can get it from the charts, or you can get it from the uh, paragraphs. And it was never marketed. (laughs) We went to the, they printed 200 of them to go to the um, Consumer Electronics Show in January of 79 where they announced the machine. Mm-hmm. And um, I probably have the only existent manuals left of that. Wow! So, of, of the original. Of the original. So when the, when the machine actually shipped, it shipped with manuals, of course. Those are not the ones you wrote. I don't think so. No, those are written by Gil Banks. It, the, you... the very first ones may have shipped with mine, but I don't think so. They didn't ship for quite a while after they announced, but they had to have these manuals for the um, for the Consumer Electronics Show. Mm-hmm. And the people in the in the pictures, the people in the pictures of the original manual um, were all uh, the folks in the office. And mm-hmm. and then they did a second version of the manual I wrote. Um, mm-hmm where they hired an artist to draw the pictures. Mm-hmm. And um, that artist uh, was also um, hired by uh, Apple. And he was doing, the, I'm trying to remember his name. He was doing the, the packaging for Apple as well. Mm-hmm. And I tried to convince them, Atari, that they should put him on commission and keep him from doing Apple because we were we were competing with Apple. Actually, at the Consumer Electronics Show, the demos were were not running on an Atari, which didn't run yet. Um, they were running on an Apple under the table. <laughs> the Atari was on top of the table. Wow. Uh, um, that wait a minute. That may not have been on the, in the com- Computer Electronics Show. That may have been in the show that we that we videotaped for uh, Sears. Hmm. Um, it was running by the electronic, consumer electronic show, but the, the first demo that we videotaped, it, it was the demo was running on the Apple. Yeah, so the Atari just didn't do anything yet. Yeah. Piece of plastic. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was still in wire wrap. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um. So okay, so you wrote this manual. They didn't actually. They printed two hundred and didn't really use it for the final product. Um. So you said you have a copy. I yeah, I have several copies. Well, I have them for the four hundred and the eight hundred. Um, oh. I haven't scanned them yet. But Can you do um, that right now today. We need it. We need it. I <laughs> The Atari community wants to see it. Uh, I'll try. Thank you. That would be great. Uh, or if you don't want to, you can loan them to me, and I can do it and send them right back. I I I, I do want it. I do want to. 
Um, okay. And and what I what I want you all all of you folks to know is that I'm um, I'm doing a virtual museum on the history of computing and learning and education. And it's hcle.org is our wiki. Eventually, that'll be a, a, the actual museum, but right now it's just a wiki um, okay. to get us started. And we want stories of of um, how people how we're documenting both how people learned computing and how they learned other things using the computer to help. Them. So the manuals are how you learn to use this machine. Mm-hmm. There, there are lots of people who are interested in games and who are uh, who are interested in technical aspects of the of the computing history. There's, as far as I know, nobody else who is looking at this intersection of learning and education and computing. And that story is being lost, um, which is very much too bad because between 1960 and 1990, we learned an awful lot about how to teach with computing and how to use these as as learning tools. Um, And um, people are now rediscovering them and trying to rediscover how to use computers as learning tools. And it's not happening in schools very well at all. So um, uh, some of that early philosophical knowledge needs to be reclaimed. And one of the ways to do it is to get those of us who learned when there weren't any teachers to mm-hmm. talk about how we learned. So I, all of your, I, I, I want stories from all of your users of, Again, about um, what they did to learn, uh, what roadblocks they had, what help they got. Some people say, oh, well, my father was an engineer and he helped me. Or some people say, I read the manuals. And some people say, well, we got together at a hobby club. Um, All of those ways of learning, we need to make sure people remember. Okay. Because you can't do it all in a school, in a class, with a teacher in the front of the room. Right. Okay. So it sounds like we're doing a trade here. Where I'm, you're trading copies of documentation, and I am, I'm giving you users who are going to come to your website and tell you how they originally learned computing. Right. Right. And okay. how they learned if they used a computer to learn anything else. Hmm. At Atari, for example, we we um, put out a whole series of. Um, educational uh, programs which were developed by Shepardson and I have all of those I think Mm -hmm. Um, and of course they were on cassette because the Atari first came out it had no disk drives it had an audio cassette are these the ones that work with the the educational system cartridge and you put that in the machine and then there are cassettes that work with it okay I have a, I have some of those. I, not all of them have been archived yet. I might need to borrow some of those from you. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know how many I have. I I've got a my my archive is a mess, um, but eventually it will be a, an archive. So you said you were married to Steve Smith for yeah. twenty years, and you were you two. Now he he wrote he if I if it's the right Steve Smith he he worked on the Antic Chip and. Uh, right, right. He helped help Jay. Well, there, there, the were, there were um, four guys whom I knew really well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Joe DeCure, mm-hmm. uh, Jay Miner, mm-hmm. uh, David Yerdrum. That's three. I knew Scott Scheiman mm-hmm. pretty well. Um, yeah, Steve, David, and, and Joe, and I. That's that makes four me. <laughs> we just we used to hang out a lot together. Mm-hmm. The four of us, and eventually I married Steve. And you were married yeah, by Jay Miner. Yeah. At I would house. like to hear that story, please. Well, Steve and, uh, Jay had hired Steve right out of DeVry um, Tech, and Steve um, he was 22 when he went to Atari. Uh, it was his first job. And he did the wire wrap of the original chips before they were manufactured um, and continued to do engineering. So Steve and Jay were very close because Steve worked directly for Jay and they were friends. And so we used to go and hang out at um, 
Jay's house, Steve and I, and sit in Jay's hot tub. And Steve and I were friends for about a year and a half, two years, and eventually he proposed to me. And, and uh, so, so uh, it turned out Jay had a Universal Life Church minister's um, certificate, as did I, mm-hmm. and I still do. Jay, of course, mm-hmm. has passed away. Um, so we asked Jay if he would marry us. So we had a um, big engagement party. I think that was also at Jay's house. Um, because when, when Steve proposed to me, I said, you don't know what you're talking about. I, w- I was married with two kids, and I'm 11 years older than Steve. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, I'll marry you in six months if you still want to marry me by then. And uh, so we had a big en- engagement party in, se- in February and uh, got married on the 1st of May. Steve thought it was very funny to get married on May Day. Uh, <laughs> And I probably have lots of pictures of Jay. Jay rented a, a long gown and pretended to be a minister. And I had a, a pretty dress and Steve had a tuxedo. And we actually had no family at that wedding except my kids, who thought it was very, very funny. Uh, but they were seven and nine. Um, but lots and lots of our friends and many Atarians. Um, actually people thought that the, a lot of people thought that the, um, engagement party was actually the wedding and they were very surprised that there was a wedding six months later, (laughs) (laughs) three months later. Anyway, it was a good party. Jay had, Jay had lots of parties at his house. One of the things very few people know about Jay is that he was interested in nudism and the local, uh, nudist group used to have their parties at his house. And he, he had a real, yeah, um, tremendously sweet guy. They had, um, uh, he and his wife, Carol, had four or five uh, little dogs that they had rescued. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I'm trying to remember the name of Jay's um, cockapoo, who used to come to work every day with him. Mm-hmm. They kept rescuing little dogs, so... You walk into Jay's house and there's this cacophony of little dogs barking at you. <laughs> um, and they had a, um, a river cruiser on the Delta. And we used to go uh, spend weekends um, rafted up with other friends, the mm-hmm. other people that Jay knew who also had boats. Um, would arrange to motor to some place in the Sacramento River Delta, and we'd all tie up together and swim and play cards and drink beer and uh, water ski, um, and that was lots of fun. Wow! So Jay was not only a fantastic engineer, but also um, knew how to have have a good time. <laughs> and then when when uh, Jay left Atari. Um, and he went on to build the Amiga. He also, uh, both uh, Joe DeCure and Steve Smith worked on that machine as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you said that you you wrote the first. So you're going ra- back in time a little bit here. You yeah. wrote and produced the, the the manual, the reference manual for the original Visicalc. Yeah. I was an employee for Personal Software. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wow. wasn't an employee for Atari. That was after um, the Atari gig. The Atari gig was the f- the first thing I did in Silicon Valley. Um, and then after I left Atari, um, after after the manuals were were done. Um, okay, let's talk about the- leaving Atari for. Okay, so you, how did you? Were you did you quit? Were you fired? Were you laid off? Or how did how did that relationship end? Or I know you uh, weren't a star. You weren't an employee. You were a contractor. So. I was a contractor, and basically the manuals were done, the, the original user manuals, and I was not, and still am not, technical enough to, to write a technical manual. My mm-hmm. forte, I, I like to think that, like Isaac Asimov, I'm a popularizer of technical things. Mm-hmm. So my forte is working with people who haven't got the slightest idea 
how to operate a machine, um, which was the market that Atari wanted, and there was nobody else there at Atari mm-hmm. who could do it. Um, but once the machine was launched and they had a, a prototype of a user's manual, um, they hired some other people to do more technical manuals. So uh, I did I did the, the user's manual for the computer itself, and then I did a user's manual for the, the tape player and maybe for the disk drive. I'll have to look that up. Um, and then Gil did... Uh, a more technical reference manual. Uh, and Gil Banks is still around. You can talk with him, too. Okay. Um, I, I have another story to tell. So um, I'm trying to think. The person that hired me in, I didn't work directly for for um, Wade Tuma. It was somebody else whose name I don't recall at this point, but Steve will know. Um who uh, who was my direct supervisor. And he left. Uh, and nobody else adopted me. So I was kind of wandering around um, with no assignment. Mm-hmm. And so I was neither fired nor let go or anything. I just didn't have any more assignments, so I stopped coming in. Mm-hmm. Um and by that time, I had moved originally, two more stories. Originally, um, I was living in Sonoma County and um, just came down to uh, the peninsula, down to Sunnyvale, in order to uh, ha- go to meetings. So when I first contracted with Atari, what I what I agreed to do was to work for Twenty dollars an hour if I was working from home, from home, mm-hmm. and forty dollars an hour if I had to come in and go to a meeting, or I had mm-hmm. to to work in the office because I had a big commute, mm-hmm. uh, and I had to stay, and I I didn't have a place to stay, so I had to stay in a hotel. So, so um, they agreed to that, uh, and. My my thinking was, if I don't do that, they're going to keep asking me to come in, and then they're not going to be organized enough to 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 make it worth my while to have driven down here. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I made it a lot more expensive for them. <laughs> and at that time, that, those were good wages. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to have me on site, but this was before telecommuting was. Um, was even a, a, a gleam in its father's eye. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this was this was a pretty radical thing to do. The other thing that, that happened, another thing that happened was that um, uh, Atari didn't pay its bills. So mm-hmm. they were constantly, um, although they were rolling in money, they were constantly running out of things because... Um, People wouldn't ship to them, <laughs> so they they had to ha- they they rotated their suppliers. But because I was being paid through that system rather than the payroll system, they didn't pay me. So I would have to go and stand in the administration the payroll the, the accounting office and say it's a week after my pay date and I have not received my check. Mm-hmm. And they would say, oh well. Uh, this is the system is all automated. We can't uh, generate a check just because you're standing here. Mm. And I would say, yes, you can. Write me a hand check and put it in the system later. I need <laughs> my check, and I'm going to stand here until you do. It. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and how long did you stand there? <laughs> oh, I. I'm sure I stood there an hour or two a couple of times. I mean, after a while, they figured it out. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, Wow. And then when, um, let's see, they changed. Um, Nolan, Nolan left, or mm-hmm. Nolan got kicked upstairs, and 
uh, Ray became the CEO. What was Ray's okay. last name? Kassar. Kassar, yeah. But there was a guy before that. Uh, before Ray, Ray, Ray didn't come from Burlington Coke Factory. Somebody else came from Burlington Mills before Ray. Um, and when he first came in, again, I have all this documented, but I haven't been thinking about it, so I don't have the names. Mm -hmm. uh, my sure. disk access is slower than it used to be. Uh, um, when he first came in, he decided that engineering needed to shape up, consumer engineering, mm -hmm. and that everybody should be at their desk, desks at 8 o'clock. Well, that, that isn't the way we worked at all. Um, right. People right. people sort of staggered in at 10 o'clock. Sure. Maybe. Especially engineers and programmers and that sort of people, right? Right, right. So um, he um, came storming into, uh, into the engineering um, area one day saying, you guys are just a bunch of uptight prima donnas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, somebody decided that was exactly correct. And there's a T-shirt which says Atari on the front and, and on the back just says, says just another uptight prima donna from Atari. <laughs> have you got the T-shirt? No, I don't have it. Well, I've I should scan it. that for you too. Yeah, that would be great. Be great. This, this might be the most important question I've ever asked. The the, the 400 and 800, their their internal code names were um, Candy and Colleen. Apparently, right. I mean, the the story is named after hot secretaries. Since you were there early, did did you ever meet Candy and Colleen? No, and I don't think that's a true story. Oh man, Stella, Stella, which was the um. Uh, the games machine. Yeah, the this computer. That, yeah, that's mm -hmm. Joe DeCure's bicycle. That's Joe DeCure's uh, what? Bicycle. Oh, okay. Stella. He had, he had a Stella bicycle. Um, and I'll have to ask Joe and Steve about Candy and Colleen. Um, they may have been people's girlfriends, but I don't think they were hot secretaries. Huh. Right. There was also a hot tub in the basement, and, and word had it that Every Friday, there were beer blasts and uh, wet T-shirt contests in, at the hot tub. Uh, I never went because I was commuting back. I had kids in Sonoma County. I had to go back and be mama. So I yeah, was yeah. never never in the hot tub room. Plus, I was not willing to wear a wet T-shirt. Sure. <laughs> no. I, I, have, I have asked several people, and I think I, people maybe who are there a little bit later at Atari, I asked them specifically about the hot tub. And I get answers like, uh, no, I never saw anything like that. Or yeah, I saw the hot tub once and it was empty. And yeah, I, I don't know. I think maybe the stories about the hot tub are better than the actual hot oh, tub was. Wonderful. <laughs> well, you should talk to Steve. Okay, I'm trying to. Uh, actually, I asked him and he said no. And I, I'm, I'm trying to convince him that uh, you should talk to him. Oh, you, you, oh, you called him already? I, I emailed him yesterday, and he said I don't remember anything. No, and then so I'm like. Oh, you just can tell me stories. It'll be great. So maybe you can tell them what a wonderful time we're having together on this conversation, and you should talk to them. Uh, okay, I'll try. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think it's I think it's fun. So anyway, but then we're very different people, which is why we're not married anymore. Well, uh, years is a stretch. Yeah, yeah, we decided to call it a successful marriage at 20 years instead of trying to make it 25 and call it a failed marriage. Right. And got divorced. I think that's exactly, exactly what Dave Small said to me about his marriage to Sandy. It's like, we had a great stretch and we decided to say, yeah, that was, that was a success. Now we're done. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. well, David, David Yardrum introduced me to Steve. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, I went back to David. <laughs> <laughs> I spent ten years with David. Wow! Well, and then broke up. Then broke up with David. But that's that's a whole other story. That's not a computer story. Um, I probably have, by the way, the sketches and rough drafts uh, that I made of the manuals. Wow! So 
and and I the way I work is to put everything up on the walls of my cubicle. Mm-hmm. And I first started out sharing a, a cubicle with Scott Scheiman. <laughs> Practically drove Scott nuts because he's very neat and organized and does not work this way at all. And I'm definitely messy and sketchy and um, have papers all over the place and would paste them on the ceiling if I could reach the ceiling. So it's a whole different thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask Steve, the candy and Colleen and see if I can get the, a, a better answer. All right. Cause Thank you. there is, there is an answer and there is an accurate answer. Right. Uh, but, but I don't know. I don't remember what, what it was. Uh, there was, <laughs> there was a, um, a very attractive woman who was um, Al Alcorn's secretary and kind of acted as the receptionist for um, for the engineering department and used to didn't have a whole lot to do. And I do remember an incident where I uh, needed a bunch of copies and she was sitting there doing nothing. And I went and asked Al if, if she could make copies for me. Um, and I only got paid for the hours that I worked. If I was sitting in the office doing nothing, I didn't charge the Atari for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Al said no. <laughs> uh, so I said, okay, if you guys want to pay me 40 bucks an hour to run a copy machine, I'm happy to do that. I just thought I'd save you some money. But they didn't care. <laughs> so cool. they paid me, paid me 40 bucks an hour to... It seems pretty typical of Atari management, frankly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the the other story that I wanted to to tell you um, had to do with the illustrations in in the manual, mm-hmm. um, because when I first came interviewed at Atari, um, the art department who had done all of the um, the industrial design on the machine itself. Um, John Hayashi was the head of the art department. I don't know if John is still alive or not. Probably he is. Um, and uh, and John was expecting to get to do the manuals, and have he had four staff of four or five people. And when they mm-hmm. took the manuals away from him and gave them to me, he was pretty annoyed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't work for John. And... Um, Rich Simone is the name of the guy that I did work for. Okay. Um, slow disaster, but it, but it's there. Um, and uh, so uh, John thought, well, okay, it was okay with him if I wrote the text, but he still got to design the manual. But as I've said, I felt like the illustrations were extremely important, and they carried the content of the manual as the technical content, as well as the words. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to do all of it, all of the design. I wanted to do specify the pictures, um, which I did, um, the page layout, the layout of um, the, um, how the captions were done on the pictures. Um, so I ended up, in a complete battle with John who wanted to make it look pretty and kept wanting to put in uh, design elements that had nothing to do with the message that the user was supposed to take away. And from my mm-hmm. perspective, were simply distractions mm-hmm. and, and um, defeated the purpose of the manual. So when you see the two versions of the manual, the first one you'll see is the one that John laid out and the second one you'll see is the one that I laid out. Hmm. Um, and I can, if, if anybody's interested, I can talk about the, the design elements and why I did it this way rather than that way. Um, okay. But there was an ongoing battle between uh, me and John hmm. about how this thing got run. And I think eventually he probably won. That may be why I eventually ended up with no assignments. 
Um, anyway, I, I, that was another just interesting dynamic that went on. And the, there were yeah. two or three women that worked in the art department. But they didn't know anything technical. Um, so they couldn't write the manual. And basically, I, I, um, we were all friends. Um, mm-hmm. But they were among the people I used to test the manual because as far as I was concerned, um, what I put down on the paper was not anywhere near as important as what the user took off that paper. So right. anything I write gets tested not by the engineers or by anybody who knows the message that I'm trying to get across, but by people who have no idea right. what should be encoded on those pages so that I find out if it really works or not. So I used the, the women in the art department for that. <laughs> <laughs> so your contract ended, you wandered away, and you ended up... I, I just want to talk briefly about writing the VisiCalc manual. Um, yeah. Okay, that was such a... A, a, a unique product at that time. I mean, did did you did you look at it? And did you did you get it and go, yeah, I I I, I understand this, or was it just like, what's this spreadsheet again? <laughs> what are we doing? You know, how did you how did how did you feel seeing this this uh, oh. this product at that time? Okay, same similar approach than the approach that I did with the Atari manual. Since the, in, with Atari, there were no specs. They couldn't tell me how it was going to work uh, right. when I went in. When I went into personal software, and I'm trying to figure out how it was I got hired, and I don't even remember. I'll have to think about that. Um, but I was hired as an employee, and they wanted to sit me down and um, tell me how it worked and explain it all to me. And I said, no, don't tell me anything. Just give me the disk and let me sit down with the machine and play with it. Because for me, the most important thing is what questions are the first questions that you come up with when you encounter a piece of software? What confuses you? What's obvious and what's confusing? Um, So I spent probably a week or two just playing with the software without um, any uh, instruction at all. Mm-hmm. And there was a, there was a, a tutorial, um, but unfortunately, it, it was, the t- tutorial was sequential. So if you you'd work through the tutorial, you had to do it in the order in which Dave wrote it. Mm-hmm. And, and you couldn't find anything in it when you wanted to go back. So so I was hired to do a reference manual. Um, and the first thing that that I realized I wanted to know was the sequence of the commands. If you do one command, if, if you if you sit down and you look at the the graph, the cell layout, and you want to start mm-hmm. putting things in cells, and you put a you have to first you have to figure out how to write a formula. You, you, you can put numbers in the cells. That's pretty pretty easy. But then you have to figure out how to get it to do something with the contents of the cells. And the formulas get more and more complicated. Right. So um, that's the way I wrote the reference manual. Um, looking first at here's a, a, a set of numbers we'll put into specific cells. Then here's how to refer to those cells then here's how to put operators between the cells. So you're building an equation. Basically, you're putting an equation in each, in, in, in each cell. And um, that building that equation uh, or series of equations led to the idea of um, writing the reference manual as a hierarchy. So what I, what I did was a big fold-out sheet, which was a chart, that went from adding a number t- to each of the related um, commands. Um, and then I took every command and, and wrote a parag- and paragraph about how to use the command, what the command was, 
and then how to use it. Um, so that's what was in the reference manual. It started out with this fold-out sheet that showed you how to, what, what all the commands were. And then you could look up each individual command. Um, and my direct supervisor was a woman named Kathleen Nandis, who um, had lived in Jeff Raskin's cottage. Jeff was one of the original, and he was a designer of the Macintosh, basically. Um, and uh, so, and Kathleen um, worshipped Jeff. So <clears throat> when I, and, and Jeff had written a lot of the Apple manuals, and I didn't like the Apple manuals. I couldn't figure out how to use the Apple from the Apple manuals. Hmm. So I would go into work at um, personal software and and write a adapter of my reference manual and give it to Kathleen, and Kathleen would say, eh, can you make it more like a Raskin manual? She didn't like the style. So I'd write the next chapter in a different style because I knew I could go back and, and edit it and put put it all in the same style when we found a style she liked. Right, right. So I went through four or five different, four or five chapters. Um, and each one was in a different style. And she couldn't say anything more than, well, can you make it more like a Raskin manual? <laughs> <laughs> so eventually I got fired. The, the, the manual was done, uh, and I I edited it and made it so that it was usable, and it got published. But they didn't, they, they, and then they fired me, and they hired, had to hire four people to fill my position. <laughs> but um, but it was it was extremely frustrating because Kathleen. And when when I had my exit interview, she said, "Well, you can't write in this ex- in, a, in a consistent style." <laughs> Kath- Kathleen couldn't imagine that I could change the writing style, and then go back and edit it and make it all the same. Right. And she couldn't articulate at all um, what she wanted. If she saw it and she liked it, she could tell. But other than that, she couldn't tell. Uh, so that was really frustrating. And the other thing that happened at VisiCalc is that uh, Mitch Kapoor was hired in after, uh, above Kathleen, to manage the documentation department. And um, Mitch spent a great deal of time sitting at his desk um, uh, looking at VisiCalc, and a year later left and and, uh, started Lotus 1, 2, 3. which, of course, su- succeeded VisiCalc. Right, right. I think I have two more questions. Um, question number one is you mentioned you ran an Atari user group, and we hadn't really talked about that. Can you tell me briefly about that? Sure. Um, it, it was, it was a, it, I'm sorry, it wasn't really a users group. It was the newsletter, Atari users newsletter. Okay. And I probably have those in a box someplace. Um, what was the newsletter was, called? There were several. I'm just trying to figure out which one you you had your hand in. It was the first one. Uh, what was it called? Atari newsletter, probably. Hmm. Um, probably started in '81, '82. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, there were no word processors, so we laid it out by hand and stuck down. You, you bought um, sticky tape with um, bold lines and things like that on it, and, right. Uh, right. and laid it out on on a uh, wax board. And I worked with a guy named Nicholas DePaul. And Nicholas, you might, if he's not a member of your group, you might want to get in touch with him as well. Okay. Uh, and DePaul? I think he, Nicholas. D E capital P A U L. All right. And I think he's in the Midwest someplace. All right. What was what was really funny was one of the really funny things is I was I was working I was living in on Star King Circle in um, Palo Alto, 
uh, probably with Steve at that point, laying out the newsletter. And uh, Nicholas was a subscriber to the newsletter and called me up and was very excited. And we had this long two-hour conversation. <laughs> Eventually, one of us said, well, we should get together. Where are you? And it turned out that he was living next door across the fence. <laughs> and we could walk outside with the telephones wired to our, our um because that was, the telephones were still wired. Right, the, cur- the curly cords attached to Yeah, and look over the fence and see each other. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so well, we became friends and, uh, and, and did the newsletter together. Oh, I have another story. The guys who started Activision were at Atari. Mm-hmm. Um, the three of them. David Crane and those guys, yeah. Yeah. And um, and we were all sitting around at one point. Somebody asked me how much I was being paid. Mm-hmm. And I told them. You know, I'm, when I'm here, I'm paying $40 an hour. When I'm working from home, I'm being paid $20 an hour. And they said, $40 an hour? We're in the wrong business. <laughs> and they all quit. And said, if you want us to work for you, hire us back as consultants for $40 an hour. Huh. <laughs> Yikes. So you, you, you made Activision happen. Well... <laughs> I think it would have happened anyway. Um, but but there was a period of time uh, when um, when they were deciding whether to um, leave. Mm-hmm. Um, and that story was part of it. Wow. Now, they may have, been, have already decided to leave, but... but right. No. Certainly didn't. Yeah, there was a Halloween Halloween um, party where Dave Crane came in in a Nixon mask. And it was <laughs> really funny. It was great. He made a great Nixon. <sighs> anyway, if you could send a message to the Atari community, and you can right now, what would you tell them? These messages are important, so I need to think about it. They are important. Uh, um, There are there are three different messages. Um, One is, wasn't it fun? We had a hell of a good time. Um, Another is, what we did. It's really important. It was revolutionary. Yeah. Um, and um, we should all feel proud of ourselves for being pioneers. Um, but the most important message is that um, learning is key to, to humanity in every epoch. And what we did has completely changed the way people learn and the way people communicate. Uh, And we need to remember that history um, and mine it for what it can teach us for today. If if we forget um, what it was like when these technologies were new and exciting and revolutionary, um, we're likely to forget some of the important lessons, philosophies, moralities Mm -hmm. that we were just discovering then. And um, that's dangerous. We We need to remember those fresh thoughts and the context when they were fresh in order to use 
the technologies wisely. Great. And people can help you doing that by going to the History of Computing for Learning and Education at hcle.org and submitting their stories and memories about learning with computers. Absolutely. And they can also get in touch with me if they want to, because I, I do do all of this stuff, as you can tell, pretty personally. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my fun. Do you are are you looking at just the the computers, or are you also looking at um, the Stella, the game console? Um, we only do the computers. Okay. Yeah, we just did the bit machines. Unless you have something super interesting, then you know I'm not going to well, know. But <laughs> one of our other good friends was Harold Lee, who mm-hmm. made the Palm chip. Mm-hmm. And and there's lots of good stories uh, about Harold, Harold and around Harold. Do you and, have uh, you, you have contact information for him still, or? Uh, I think I can find him. I would. What uh, I would honestly do is I would pass it on to one of the the 2600 podcast people and say, hey. Here's a guy you're gonna to want to talk to. So. Yeah, well, one of one of the best stories is that that um, Harold was was offered um, a, a buyout for the chip or a dollar per chip, mm-hmm. and he took the buyout. Yeah, and for the next ten years, regretted it <laughs> because although his buyout was in the millions, uh, mm-hmm. it was nowhere near as many millions as a dollar per chip would have given him. Right. Yeah. So he took, he took a lump sum instead of a... a right. Book for instead the, of a royalty. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, Carl gonna... also used to have, have wonderful parties. He he bought a villa up in uh, on Skyline. In, uh, oh, you're in Portland. Did you, did you ever live in the peninsula? No. No. Okay, well, there's, there's, a, there's a Pacific Ocean and a... a very small plain in some places, and then a uh, um, range of high hills, like 2,500 foot hills, and then another plain, and and then the San Francisco Bay, and then another range of hills. And Harold was on the, you could see the Pacific Ocean from Harold's villa, and uh, that's what he bought with his millions. And then it was mm-hmm. destroyed in the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake. Yeah. <laughs> but, but before then, it was it was the it was built by the it was it was like a Roman um, a Roman villa. It was built in the style of a Roman villa with a courtyard in the middle, and it was built by the heirs of Dole Pineapple. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. And we used to have wonderful parties there. <laughs> <laughs> so the story of Atari is a lot of a lot of the story of Atari is a story of really good parties. <laughs> in, including the Consumer Electronics Show in uh, in 1979. By the way, I have lots of old Ataris of the originals. Uh, I usually, no, I usually ask that question, and I, I skipped it for some reason. Tell me about what you have. You have uh, I have I have 400. I think I have 400s and 800s. I have original cartridges. I have. Um, uh, Tape, decks, disk drives. Uh, I have some uh, Stellas, and I have diskettes and and cassette tapes. Wow. And I so, assume they are, put, they are they are lovingly stored away with the with the Apple One. They are lovingly stored away. Yes. <laughs> oh, I have another story for you. Um, I want to give I want to give most of it away, except that uh, one of the projects for HCLE is to do a 1980s um, school computer laboratory with all the software running on on original machines right. as a traveling exhibit that museums can rent. Please, um, and so I want to keep enough machines for that. Right. Uh, and of course, they won't stay running very long, so I have to have lots of backups. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, what was the other story? Oh, the other story that I was going to tell you uh, is an educational story about um, 
after several years after I left Atari, uh, I was working with um, a friend, Richard Wynn, um, who got a grant to teach underprivileged kids at in the Berkeley area computing. Mm-hmm. And we went to Atari and um, at the time, the, the 400 and 800 were still in production. And um, when a machine failed in the field, uh, they had they were guaranteed, so they had they were warranted, and so they replaced it. Mm-hmm. And they had a warehouse full of dead machines. <laughs> they never tested them. They didn't even know if they were dead. They just replaced the machine. Wow. And so I had uh, a high school neighbor go, who was uh, an enthusiast, go through those machines. I, I, we got Atari to donate them to the project. We went through the machines and got them all working, or got as many mm-hmm. working as we could. And then we were able to donate those machines to schools. Wow. And um, the in order to get the machine, um, the school had to put together a class of parents and kids mm-hmm. who took a course from Richard and myself uh, where we taught word processing, spreadsheet, and um, and and some graphics, um, and then once the the, um, the parents and the kids had taken the class, then they could borrow the machine and take it home from the school library. Um, so that was it was called a four C's pro- program, and that was um, one of the educational things we did with Atari's after, um, after I left. Wow. Well, awesome. Yeah. But they were just, uh, uh, computing did not just suddenly appear on the educational scene. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a long, slow process of teaching teachers one at a time of, um, finding ways for teachers to, um, to get their heads around the fact that if a kid and 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 the parents got into computing, um, they would know much more about the computer than the teacher would, and uh, how to use it. And the teacher could not run a teacher-centered class with a computer in it because the teacher would have a couple of students who knew a whole lot more than the teacher did. Mm -hmm. So it really um, changed the teaching process for a lot of educators. Um, And of course, uh, all of us who were bored in school um, suddenly had a Trojan horse that let us out of school. (laughs) So... Any other questions? Have we have we done it? That's it. I am, we have done it. Okay. All right. All right. And I really, I, I, as, as I said, I love to do this. I really appreciate being interviewed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liza. I appreciate your time. That's okay. great. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.